Yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone uh, from CSI for uh, promoting this, for helping uh, market it, and of course, helping run it. Um, I'm really stoked to uh, be back here running a Lunch and Learn. So I'll get right to it, telling you a bit about my uh, background. Um, as um, you heard, I used to run a poetry series, an arts festival as well, and it was centered around spoken word. If you've been to a poetry slam at the Drake Hotel or Hot Dog Cinema in the past uh, 20 years, likely I was involved in helping organize it, and that required um, funding. We did have revenue coming in through the door, but that was not something we could rely on as we had a lot of capital costs relating to um, hiring certain marketing personnel, uh, bringing in poets from uh, around the world, not just uh, from the GTA or Ontario, to add their, their talent to our stage. And so we need to get grant funding from the Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, and the Canada Council of the Arts. Now, those are my kind of specialty kind of areas is arts funding, both for organizations like Toronto Poetry Slam, for the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word, which I helped run with another poetry leader in Toronto named Dwayne Morgan in 2006 and 2011. So that was a big festival compared to a local series that needed more capacity building funding uh, to program events throughout the year. But I also did um, uh, successful grants, wrote uh, successful grants for myself as an individual spoken word and theater artist. So if you're an artist out there, um, you might have questions, of course, about your organization. But if you're also in the arts in some way and you have questions about individual arts grants, um, I can probably help address those at the end of the grant as well. And I'll try to pepper in some of those uh, advice nuggets that I got that I kind of learned over the years about writing individual grants as well. Now, the main caveat, though, that I want to share is, is that I've never written grants solely by myself for uh, startups, charities, or nonprofits, let's say, in social justice or food security or youth empowerment, many other areas, of course, where you could get a grant. But in talking with other grant writers in preparation for this talk, I realized that a lot of the skills are analogous, whether you're writing for a granting body for an arts organization, a festival, uh, for yourself, or for a charity startup or a nonprofit. And I'll, I'll kind of share why there's a lot of um, in-sync kind of um, writing and research that's needed, no matter what kind of grant you write. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time getting into where to find grants, because that could be another half hour of going through every single website, but rest assured there are grants for almost every area of either work you do in your nonprofit or organization or as an artist. Everything from um, leveling up the skills of your workforce to funding you know, your organization through capacity building or seed grants. And really the areas of where you can go to find grants in Canada are numerous. And we're actually lucky to live also in Toronto where there are three levels of grants to apply for from the government, City of Toronto, Ontario, and of course, federal. And within even that, those areas, there's ways to find grants within the City of Toronto. Like the City of Toronto has neighborhood grants, they have um, impact grants, they have grants relating to youth violence, they have grants relating to um, food security, and there's so much to really discover, it can be overwhelming. And so that's why some organizations want to hire grant writers like myself or um, others to help parse through the many grants there are and to help write them because they got so many other things going on in running their organization. Um, Ontario Trillium Foundation is, is a great resource. Uh, Canadian government grants on for instance, I spoke to my friend Kate, who writes grants for the uh, Niagara Arts um, Multicultural Center on Women's Economic and Leadership Opportunities Fund, wage grants. And so there are a lot of grants to look for. And so it could be as simple as putting in your niche or your sector and the word grants in Canada and finding what, what spits out. Um, be wary of some kind of sites that try to rate high on SEO that really just list grants without really giving you uh, much information on them. So just try to find the exact URL of, let's say, Government of Canada Grants, City of Toronto Grants, or Canada Council of the Arts Grants websites to find out what you need to find out. So what I'm going to do is a share screen. 
So uh, really, folks, that uh, hopefully you can see your screen when I do the shared screen. I'm not going to have like a lot of PowerPointy stuff. This is just mainly I, I did some uh, quick uh, uh, smart art on Word. So um, I want to share with you some advice, but in an easily accessible format. And you don't need to take notes on this because this is going to be something I will be able to share with folks if you email me after the talk today. So don't feel like you can you have to scramble and write stuff down. Feel free to, but feel free to relax and enjoy the talk. And I can share this with you, uh, this doc, at a later date. So I'm just going to do the share screen thing. Great. Everyone can see this okay? Let me know if you can't. Awesome. So first, research. What you really have to do before you start writing your grant is find out about the grant um, streams, funding priorities and goals. Really go through that with a fine tooth comb because every grant and even sub-grant within, within that larger sector grant might have different funding priorities and goals that may align with what your startup and organization is doing, that, but may not. And that also comes down to ensuring that you're eligible. I made a mistake one time of applying for a grant as an individual when I wasn't um, eligible, and that just wasted around, you know, probably 15 to 20 hours worth of work, but that was a lesson, expensive lesson, but it was a lesson nonetheless of making sure I go through their elig eligibility criteria, with, also with a fine tooth comb, to ensure that what I am as an artist, or you are as a nonprofit or organization, aligns with what they are looking to fund. And don't leave these research kind of um, portions of your grant writing to the last minute either. Let's say if the grant is due December 1st and you're starting to research it on November 20th, that's just gonna cause you a lot of stress, burning the midnight oil, and perhaps making you feel more rushed than you need to. And that will result in errors, perhaps in the budget, support material, or in your actual project uh, writing. And also when it comes to research, don't forget to reach out to folks if you know that they have received this grant in the past. A lot of granting bodies like Ontario Arts Council and Canada Council of the Arts list grant recipients. They are actually are obligated to by, the, by their uh, governing bodies. So because they are listing every single person and organization that got a grant, whether that's a publisher, out in um, you know Huntsville to a, um, a dancer in GTA, maybe looking through that list, you find that friend of yours that you used to be friends with in university or your neighbor uh, got a grant. And it never hurts to reach out to that person who's uh, got a grant that you are applying for to find out their process. It's not as competitive as you think it is. Um, because people like to share their knowledge, especially if you're friendly with this person and known them for a while and you're kind of curious about their project and maybe some of the challenges they had in compiling a budget, compiling their support material. And I want to show you an example of some um, guidelines and eligibility criteria from granting bodies. And I'll just go quickly to uh, one of them. Identify an Impact is a grant program from the City of Toronto that is for uh, various neighborhood grants that is, and this one is uh, focused on youth. So what's really great about this application, and not every application will have this, is examples of eligible or past INI projects. So for instance, you could look at, okay, there was a project relating to culturally culturally relevant workshops and training for Caribbean, African, and Black youth of diverse genders. There was another project that they funded on leadership and mentor, mentorship programs for 25 youth living in the West End of Toronto. Another one called Good Guys on uh, Black Masculinity Workshops for uh, Black men aged 18 to 29. And look at also of how they're able to be very specific in who are they they're serving and that's going to give you a hint of what you need to do in your project application too everything from getting down to how long these workshops are that you want to help facilitate for youth to the target audience you're trying to reach you know look at that 18 to 29 highlight over there they're not just saying black youth or uh, uh, adult men they're being specific as possible and so when you do your application um, research just ensure that you're eligible and that will also be um, applicable in things like here. 
the government of Ganda. Uh, remember, I mentioned that Women's Economic and Leadership Opportunities Fund for nonprofits uh, in Canada. Also, they have a call for proposal for a Women's Capacity Fund. Again, click on eligibility. Obviously, find out everything else about this, including the calls for proposal, but click on eligibility for sure before you begin writing your grant to ensure that you are a not for profit legally constituted, have proof of incorporation. And that's also very important if you're um, incorporated or a nonprofit and you have experience in advancing equality for women. If you drill down a bit more, we also find out what they also define as women's organizations or indigenous women's organizations. And then these are the not eligible funding. And so that's also important to look at. Where am I not eligible? Perhaps um, individuals, okay, that's, that's a key factor. Educational institutions, if you're representing a school, this isn't for you. If you're representing a research org, also not for you. And so when you're also able to, to drill down to the eligibility, you find about their maximum amounts. And that's obviously going to help you with your budget. And I may be saying things you already know, but for those of you who've never applied for a grant, this is also a really important area to look at because you can look at um, the maximums and then work backwards on your budget because you may be able to you know, get more than one grant from one body, but from this body, it's obviously, let's say, up to 350,000, up to 600,000 on their uh, stream B, you know, there's different streams, and obviously capacity building, which is not just project-based, but for your organization as a whole to operate annually, um, it's, it's up to 125,000 uh, with a local reach. And of course, there's obviously different kinds of uh, branches and uh, with you know territorial or interterritorial reach. Read through these notes quite um, thoroughly. And another advice uh, bit that I would share here too is if there's a call for information session, that means a Zoom session with the grant officer for folks who have never applied for this grant before, join. Um, move things around in your schedule if you can, but the more information you can get from that grant officer, um, on eligibility, on funding priorities, on the language they like to see, even on you know what they're looking for in terms of support material. All of those can be asked at the grant officer's Zoom session. It's usually over Zoom these days. Uh, that is not just on one time um, per quarter, but it might be two different sessions that you can go to because they're re you know they're cognizant of people's um, schedules. Okay, so that's the research part uh, of it all. And now we're gonna get down to the nitty gritty, which is writing. And I think there are, I, I use the three C's for really strong grant writing, uh, no matter what kind of stream you're in. Clear, concise, and compelling. That's actually the same advice I give to journalists and fiction writers when I coach them, but it's applicable in grant writing as well. You wanna be very clear and concise on the goal of your project. In that area of the application where it says describe your project, don't go deep into the history of you as an individual, what motivates you as an artist, or all the marketing that you're going to do to promote this or that project. Be very clear about what the goal of the project is and how it aligns to the grant's objectives. I think a lot of first-time applicants get this wrong because they think this is the part where I put down everything, everything from who we are as an org to our big successes. Um, but if that's not the area, if that's not the field that they are looking for, there's a separate field for that, then you're going to really be irrelevant. You're going to confuse the jury or the uh, grant officer, and they're going to wonder why you didn't follow instructions. And that might be a signal to them that you're not ready to receive this grant. Now, don't forget to bring passion into this compelling writing. There's gonna be an area where you can talk about your organization's history. And if you have a compelling story about how you came to found your company, how you came to align yourself with this social justice project or arts um, track that you're on or mandate that your publisher has, then share it, you know, but don't go too long in the tooth. I mean, Back when I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, I was a young boy reading books, and that's why I decided to become a publisher. Just get to the heart of the story of why you um, and your team perhaps created this, this um, organization, why it's important to you and your team to align with this mission, and perhaps why 
communities are underserved by the kind of mission that you're uh, seeking to get funding for. And what's critical here too, somewhat aligned with what I said earlier is don't repeat yourself. It's really easy to feel like, oh, it's 1800 characters maximum. I got to reach 1780. I got to reach the maximum amount of characters that they require because more info is better. I don't agree. I don't think you should be too short on what your, let's say, project history is or your mandate or how it's going to uh, improve you as an organization or as an artist or how you are you know, funding the artists that you intend to bring into your application. But just ensure that you are saying the most relevant material in the most relevant field and don't repeat, let's say, your project goal in another area that doesn't ask for your project goal. And don't feel like you always have to reach the maximum character amount as well. If you're 200 you know, characters short, 300 characters short, that's totally fine. Maybe you said what you need to say in a very clear, concise, and compelling way. And I'll show you the kind of questions that might be asked. And I, I'm more familiar with Canada Council of the Arts than any other granting body. So I'll just share with you some of the questions they may ask that you will have to answer specifically. And some of the you know, granting applications do give you hints of what to answer. So go into a grant application for a research and creation grant from the Canada Council of the Arts. This is for you to begin a project, um, project start date, project end date. Obviously you need to know that right from the get go. You can't be waffling about, oh, you know, beginning of the fall to the end of the winter. You have to be very specific about the dates you input. For instance, and in, for the arts, what art form or expression are most relevant to this application? Um, you know, to give you examples, hip hop, theater for young audiences, poetry, graphic novel. Um, it's fine if you have, you know, multi arts, just be very clear about what those artistic streams are. Here's the big meat of it all, right? 5,000 characters, 750 words describe your project. And they give you a little hint here too, include information on the key artists you'll be working with if, if applicable. For those of you running nonprofits and organizations, uh, Similar question you might get from Government of Canada is include information on the key partners, community partners you'll be working with if applicable. So make sure you don't ignore this little kind of clue of what to include in your application because that's what the jury is going to be looking for, um, as well as how clear and the inspiration for your project and why you wish to undertake it at that time. So something really important to explain is the urgency in your project. Why now? Why is it important to get this project or to fund your organization now as opposed to five years ago or five years from now or uh, two years from now? Why is there something timely now? And what I found to be kind of helpful is use evidence-based research to explain the now. What does that mean? So if there's growing interest in your organization, if you're getting lots of emails and it's statistically something like you're getting 150% more inquiries about your organization than the quarter before or the year before. Include that in your project description or your organization history. Really, I think that would actually fit best fit in your project description to explain why now is the important time because there's growing interest in this or that area of your organization. And if you don't have that kind of statistic, maybe you were successful in undertaking a great festival or fundraising project where you saw 190 people come through the doors of your um, event, and that was 50% more than the same event last year. Same kind of thing. Bring that evidence-based um, content into your application to show that there's growing interest in your organization to warrant why this is important now. Here's an act, you know, where you outline your project plan, including timeline. So a lot of organizations, sorry, a lot of grants require your organization to have a timeline of when you're going to complete subtasks within the grander task of completing your project. So for instance, when I'm applying for a grant relating to creating a new spoken word show, which I have and which I thankfully have gotten uh, grant funding for from both Canada Council and Ontario Arts Council, I have to explain the moment from when I conceived of the project to when I began in progress. to when I began to um, interview folks for my project, if relevant, when I began to collate kind of marketing materials 
and audio recording materials and videographers that would be involved in my project. And so that those all need specific dates that will lead up to your project end date. So ensure you have that timeline um, solidified with your team and that it's not set in stone, right? Things can be malleable within the timeline um, when you get the funding and you know your final report can reflect that, but just ensure you have some specifics in your timeline. Now in the arts community, this is a key kind of question. How will this project contribute to your artistic development and advance artistic practice? And then they give you hints again of the kind of questions you need to answer. What type of artistic risks will you be taking? Are you exploring a traditional artistic practice in a new way, et cetera? So now you can talk about you. Now you're not really talking about the community that you're serving, let's say, as an artist or as an arts organization, but how are you gonna improve yourself as an artist by learning a new kind of method of perhaps storytelling or of working with artists that aren't in your stream or of using a new type of technology to deliver your content to a new kind of audience, let's say through, I don't know, AR, VR, if, if we're going a little highfalutin, or maybe you're bringing your project into the metaverse and you're really excited about how that's going to advance your artistic practice and development by engaging with a new kind of audience and a new kind of format, perhaps of storytelling that you will need to hone thanks to this grant. If you are hiring artists or bringing in partners, you might need to explain either A, how, the, how will they be paid? If you're going, let's say by actual rates, for instance, or union rates to pay certain artists, if they're not unionized, like how many uh, folks aren't, um, explain the kind of hourly rate that they charge and why you are uh, paying them this uh, rate. If you are enabling partners to join in on your community related grant, it might be less about the fees you're paying them, but why you decided on this partner. You know, why do you decide to fold in this community partner as opposed to another? Is there a track record that they displayed that was really impressive to you? Are their goals synced with your goals in serving this or that kind of mission to uh, the community in, in the GTA? A growing kind of question now, which you know, you need to answer, but you don't need to stress out too much about is how would you ensure safe working conditions for those involved in this project? Somewhat related to COVID, but I think I saw this prior to COVID as well. Um, these are more on-site kind of uh, projects. If you're running an arts festival that's outdoors and, you know, weather and, and you know, uh, things can happen outdoors that may be unexpected, how we they are uh, safe work environment can also rel be related to inclusionary language inclusiveness, um, the ability to remote work if uh, that is a focus for people who may be immunocompromised and don't want to work uh, in person with an organization that has a uh, bricks and mortar headquarters. So just ensure you answer that. Again, they don't give you a lot of words, just a hundred words for that. Also, if your proposed activity touches upon additional traditional knowledge, linguistic or cultural intellectual property, this is the field for it as well. You can talk to, you can bring up indigenous related um, content higher up in your project goal, but there's a specific area for it. So make sure that if you do have outreach and a lot more, um, a lot more bodies are looking for ways to uh, bring in indigenous knowledge seekers or indigenous community um, partners, be sure you're very clear about um, how they were, um, oh, sorry, why they were approached and how, again, appropriate protocols will be observed or addressed. Uh, there's also an area to contribute to something that, you know, maybe there was something you didn't bring up in these fields that you really want to. Maybe um, you want to share maybe some marketing or promo content, but make sure, as they say here, do not use a space to provide information related to earlier questions. So again, this is the important part of not being um, repetitive. Okay. Getting back to here, we're going to go just down one more step to budget. Budget stresses people out, right? Not all of us are mathy folks. I definitely am not, but I, I learned to be when I was running Toronto Poetry Slam and had to um, weigh expenses versus revenue. Now, the key thing for a budget is being clear and sensible. Clear about your expense line items, uh, not being vague. You know, you don't want to say something like marketing costs this much. Marketing is a big grand term. There's various things within marketing that you need to explain and justify. 
Same thing with um, revenue. You know, if you have a revenue portion of your budget, um, you know, 90% of budgets do have a revenue portion. Explain how you're bringing in revenue to, let's say, your arts festival or let's say to this product that you're uh, willing to you know, share with your uh, clients if you have a product that you can get funding for. And really conduct research on those estimated amounts, right? You're not going to maybe know offhand what it costs to record in a studio, right? Contact the studio, contact the recording studio in question even, and find out how much they charge per hour on engineering, on recording and mixing and equipment rental. These are all things that you need to do, obviously, weeks beforehand, which, again, stresses that point of don't leave grants to the last minute. You won't have time to do all this research on your budget if you're leaving things a week, 10 days uh, to go. And marketing costs are very easy to estimate now, too. You know, we all know roughly how much Facebook ads cost if you've run them before. If you've done Google ads, you could find out the rough cost as well. But even, um, you know, talking to folks who have run Google ads or printed out flyers or um, done outreach to, to newspapers and, and perhaps hired a PR uh, company to do some spot work and uh, writing press releases. Just make sure you do some of that research ahead of time and just don't go with what you're seeing on Google searches, right? There's a little bit of wariness. Uh, I'm going to preach about that. It's really best to talk to folks on the ground who work in the field that they work in to get those uh, estimates. Now, the one thing I want to stress too is as important as a budget is, don't um, overwhelm yourself with how important it is. It's not as critical in my mind as other areas such as project description and how you're going to be serving your community with your project goal. Because when I was on a jury, I forgot to mention this, by the way, I was on a jury for the Canada Council of the Arts in 2009 for their um, poetry program. And so I looked at around 90 different grants and the, and the budgets were not as important in our minds as the other content. Now we looked for estimates that were way too high, estimates that were way too low, but if there was something in between that, you know, that was fine for us. And if there was something that felt a little um, out of place, like perhaps someone was requiring to pay themselves for four months of work when really we noticed there was only two months of work they were doing and the rest was perhaps, um, you know, kind of the denouement or aftermath of the project, we kind of might have questioned that and might have reduced the amount of funding they got perhaps based on uh, high estimates of perhaps overpaying or profiteering as well. So that's why I also stress here in the don't section, don't do it alone, especially if you're not a numbers person. If you're working for a nonprofit organization, you probably have on your team a few folks who are really skilled at accounting, at doing your finances, doing your taxes. And so really lean on them to help with the budget because they'll be best um, prepared to, to do that kind of budget. And oh yeah, I wanna show you an example of a sample of kind of Ontario Trillium budget here. Um, Ontario Trillium Foundation, by the way, great resource for a lot of nonprofits to um, apply to. Here is, I'm gonna scroll down to their budget. So there's direct personal cost, you know, project manager, everything from uh, breaking, and you don't need to break this down in your budget notes, right? So you're not gonna just be able to say, project manager, 65 grand. Why are they getting 65 grand? Is it because of this? 25 an hour times 40 hours a week uh, times 52 weeks. And then everything from translation of materials to website design, which may be a key factor if you're launching a new um, project within your organization that requires a website. You might even want to break this down, uh, which they don't, into why you're justifying that $5,000. And then everything as well, equipment rental, $4,000, digital costs, $7,000. Uh, in budget notes, again, you're going to want to break this down of why uh, things cost 4000 What equipment are you renting? For how many sessions? That could be everything from an overhead projector to mic stands to, um, you know, clipboards that you need to buy. I mean, that's more supplies and equipment rental. There's an area for supplies as well right here. Things that you don't rent and things that you buy. Health and safety supplies like masks, um, like, you know, um, uh, hand, hand sanitizer, uh, especially if you're doing on-site events. That all has to be budgeted as well. 
And then there's travel, right? So if you're hiring folks, if you're going somewhere um, as well, if you're um, doing a cross kind of provincial project, if you're doing a research project as an organization that's related, let's say, to public health um, outside the GTA, again, estimate the travel. And again, you could do this obviously roughly with what gas prices are or what transit fares are costing or what fares are costing at the time of writing. Things will fluctuate, of course, um, but folks who read grants aren't going to you know, penalize you too harsh on that. Okay, just going back now to my Word doc. Support material. Support material will vary depending on the grant that you apply for, whether artistic or cultural or um, you know, nonprofit or uh, federal. But essentially, be prepared to share financial statements, letters of incorporation, letters of interest, permits, licenses, if applicable, and your applicant mandate. Now, for artists, the most important material for us to share is our past work our photos, our films, our past writing, our um, dance projects that we hopefully have on video. Video is very important to have for a lot of multimedia and media projects and also for folks in theater and, and acting as sound and text, not as really impacting as anything on video. Also be wary, some places like Ontario Arts Council don't accept YouTube videos, uh, but only Vimeo. I don't know why Vimeo is making a comeback with granting bodies, but they are. So be sure you have some of your content on as many video platforms as possible. And don't just, let's say, rely on YouTube. And make sure that your support material syncs up with what the project guidelines ask for and your theme of your own application. So, for example, if you're applying for a project relating to how you as a dancer want to work with musicians in a new capacity? Do you have any kind of past material where you have tinkered with musicianship before, where there's been background sound on your dance material, where you have some kind of relationship to music, even if it's not longer than two minutes, that's fine. Um, but make sure that your support material is hopefully as relevant to your project as possible. Now, don't include in your support material irrelevant material, right? So reference letters, we all think are important, but not every application requires them. So don't include them if they are not required. Juries, again, don't have more than sometimes five, six minutes to read support material. I know that from being on a jury, we would get a 20 minute video and we'd only have to be able to watch the five first five minutes. What that applicant needed to do was give us a timestamp of starting from 000 to, you know, 448. Uh, it could have been from, you know, 550 to, let's say, 1050 in the YouTube video or Vimeo video. That has to also be very clear and concise as well, your support material. You're going to probably need partner agreements as well if you're a nonprofit working with community partners. And that's also why you don't leave this to the last minute. To get letters from people that are outside your organization, is a hassle. People are busy. Um, they leave things to the last minute as well. So when you need to get something from someone else, a reference letter, a community partner statement, or a biography of an artist that you are including in your application, it will require you, I'm going to say three weeks lead time. Um, don't expect folks to do this within 48 hours turnaround. That would be great. But a lot of folks have other things going on. And so that's why, again, don't rely until the last minute. So more support material, by the way, is also something you can ask your fellow grant recipient friends about. You know, if your friend got that grant for their, um, you know, youth empowerment project, find out what kind of material they used, whether that was community partner statements, where that maybe might have been marketing material if that was requested of them. Maybe there was uh, a YouTube focused kind of a seminar that they did on uh, youth uh, facilitator workshops that might be relevant to their project, find out what other folks did that worked for them. And lastly, proofread everything. And you want to learn, so so this is a, a, a great statement from William Zinser, who is one of my uh, uh, favorite authors on writing nonfiction. And what he says here relates to literary nonfiction, but I think it relates to grants. And you can give it a read yourself as I, as I talk, but essentially he says, and this is a whole probably other workshop, is proofread not just for spelling, not just for grammar, but also are you using uh, the most impacting verbs, nouns, 
things that have a bit more oomph to them or not? Are you overusing words like, I don't know, like holistic, you know, five times in the same product description because it sounds good or, um, you know, five, $10 words because it makes you sound smart. You don't want to have a jury kind of roll their eyes being like, okay, they're just copying language from our, you know, grant applications as opposed to coming up with their own kind of language um, to share what their product mission is. Just be wary of, of that. Ooh, it's 1241. So I want to make sure I leave some room for questions that might be in the stream. I haven't noticed that. And the last thing I'll share are some advice and tips from other pro grant writers. Me being a journalist, I want to learn what my friends Kate and Johnny said about grant writing. Some of this is a maybe a tad repetitive from what I said, but here's their quick bullet points. And Kate and Johnny have applied for grants that were um, non-artistic grants, so for nonprofits and for organizations in social justice spaces. Johnny said, go to any info session you can. That's what I stress from the top. I highly recommend it as well. He says to ensure you get pre-screened, right? Because you, you might find out at that info session that you aren't eligible. Um, make sure you read the application questions to match the question to the civic strategy that they are focused on. And that's really important. Uh, read the application questions so much, they're practically memorized. Now, Kate had an interesting kind of point. She said, use the language of the grant request for proposals and application, but also use language that is emerging. When she applied for grants relating to public health or for leveling up the skills of workers employed at the multicultural center in the Niagara region, one term that is important to her is cultural safety. Started using it widely, you know, a bit, and then everyone else started uh, using it, and then they pitched it positioned it as um, innovative. Johnny said, highlight geographical impact, especially for place-based funders. What do, what do I mean by that? Well, in the artistic community, Canada Council of the Arts, there is one grant to serve um, First Nations communities. That has a geographical impact, right? So in your project description, in your why this matters, you're not talking about why this is important for your GTA audience, but for First Nations communities, perhaps in the communities north of Toronto that you will be serving if that is going to be an on-site kind of project. And so that's why understanding the geography you are serving is also so important. Might require a few visits, might require learning from, you know, Indigenous community leaders about the geography kind of makeup that may be different than the makeup, of course, of where you live. And that is going to be important to stress in your application. Don't expect every grant to be successful. You know, I started out probably one out of five grants was successful for me in the early 2000s. Started to get better the more grants I wrote. And you will improve the more you write grants or the more you perhaps you learn from professional grant writers that can, you know, spend some time with you on using the right kind of language to express your mission and your project statements. But realize, and this is something that I found out, you can reuse a grant that got a no to perhaps get a yes next year or next quarter. Just because that granting body said no in 2022 doesn't mean you can't apply to that same granting body with the same grant kind of backbone and skeleton, but maybe tweak it a bit to be relevant to this year's kind of urgent matters or um, this year's statistics or financial statements, of course. But realize just because a grant isn't successful doesn't mean you have to scrap it, throw it away and never revisit it. You can use it again. And I've done that myself. I know many artists have gotten, um, let's say, no's from Ontario Arts Council, but use that same grant for Canada Council of the Arts or TAC, Toronto Arts Council, and have received yeses. Especially if you feel like it was a strong grant, people in your organization also felt strongly about it, and it was you know, in your mind, important for you to, to pull off. I'm lastly, gonna put in my uh, email here and also, oops, sorry, in the um, uh, contact me, sorry, sorry, the chat of the, uh, the Zoom here so that you can get a hold of me if A, you want this doc and uh, B, you would like to um, learn more about my grant writing services. So I'll just put that in there now. So I believe there may be some questions. I haven't strolled through the uh, the chat board yet, but I can. Um, if so far, 
Yeah, so far, no questions except asking if you might uh, share the recording that people if they email you if if that was one question earlier. But, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, to totally welcome for that. But uh, again, yeah, I, I, maybe folks save their um, uh, questions for uh, vocal uh, vocal sharing. <laughs> so if you want to share right now, um, Stefan, I don't know how you like to do it with a hand up kind of thing or people just. Just either one if ask. folks want to drop it in the chat or yeah or if there's a hand up uh whichever folks uh feel is is better yeah if any questions for david please please share and also david thank you so much for that wonderful presentation oh thank you appreciate it well while you wait i have a question uh which maybe have which is which is if uh you know often these types of things have sort of rotations in terms of when uh, more grants come available or not. I wonder if there's like a timing situation or people should be like really paying attention to certain periods of time when a lot come on board or something like that. Well, sometimes that also depends on who's running our government, right? So when the Trudeau government came in power, we got an injection of, of funding into the Canada Council of the Arts that encouraged a lot of artists to apply, as we saw a bit of a kind of funding during uh, the Harper reign. And so that was a signal. And I know from folks who were involved in the Canada Council of the Arts uh, kind of uh, backroom saying, you know, apply now because we don't know what's going to happen if he's out of power. We don't know how much funding Canada Council of the Arts and downstream perhaps OAC will also have if there's another a provincial leader who believes that arts funding isn't important for communities. So that is really important as well. Um, I think sometimes applying when there's a new grant as Canada Council has introduced a new grant for digital infrastructure, for uh, digital projects around a few years ago, I think sometimes applying for a new grant is, is a strong idea um, because first time applicants might be, you know, there might not many be first time applicants for, for a new grant. So I've seen sometimes grant rates of around 80% for first time grants, which again, is all publishable material that Canada Council and other granting bodies run by the federal government have to uh, deliver after a certain period. So if there's hundred applicants and 80 folks get it, that's a pretty good rate. And so if you see that kind of high rate for a grant by going through the grant recipient portion, um, of that stream, that's a signal to you. That's a high rate of acceptance. You should start applying now before that acceptance rate gets a bit lower. Great, thank you. Uh, so we do have a question uh, from Laura in the chat, uh, oh, two, so we'll start with the first one. Uh, how best to demonstrate potential impact of a project, say development, when you don't really know until the project is completed? Mm -hmm. that, that's a great question. If there's any kind of similar project that you ran in the past that was successful, that had an impact, that's where it fits here. If this is a completely new project that is outside your kind of organization's uh, main mission or main goal, that, that's going to be a bit more challenging. It's all about what you believe will be important for audiences to learn from this project. You, you can't have any tangible stats, right? You can't say that 80% of youth involved in this project will have um, more confidence in, in uh, confronting bullies than before. You can't, you can't make up stats like that. But you can perhaps give analogous stats from perhaps studies or reports that have found that, according to this University of Guelph study, that found that um, youth who were involved in community-based initiatives were empowered to X, Y, and Z. So if there's evidence that is related or tangentially related to what your project aims to do that comes from you know respectable bodies like university academics or white papers or other kind of ebooks and reports from um, consultancy groups perhaps that might be important to put in to show how something similar has impacted youth but may not be directly related to your own organization Awesome. Thanks. Uh, another question is, uh, do you think do you think there's a trend or shift of video format? Uh, you sort of talk about YouTube, but have you noticed that there's a shift in that direction? Yeah, I think more in the arts than, than the non-arts. So I think for a lot of uh, nonprofits and organizations, startups, you don't have to worry too much on this, except perhaps for marketing material. If you have marketing material, so such as YouTube explainers about your company or any kind of recordings of panel events that you ran that might be important to include. But for the arts, yeah, there's been a stress on video simply because if you're working in a space that benefits from performance, 
it benefits the juries to see that performance as opposed to text-based scripts, text-based poems and spoken word poems that aren't going to really translate your skills on stage um, in, in the best way. Um, there really has been a lot of YouTube and Vimeo requests since I think OAC, CCA shifted to online formats back in the day. Actually, you had to print out lots of different copies before they went online and make eight different copies. And you couldn't do video or uh, Vimeo probably in the mid 2000s. But since that shift to digital, um, they put a real premium on that. And also SoundCloud. So if you're um, a musician, if you don't have uh, content and or if you're, you're a podcast and you don't obviously have po uh, podcast videos on YouTube, um, ensure that you have files that are kind of clippable enough to also share in your support material since you don't need to share a 40 minute podcast episode, but it, perhaps you need to share a five minute clip from that episode. Awesome. Uh, one more question in the chat uh, from Russell. Uh, any advice for applying for grants at U.S. foundations? Are there anything, anything different? I haven't had any experience in applying for U.S. foundations, but in my research for this grant and learning what U.S. folks are doing with their grant proposals, it's pretty similar. There's not much difference in what I said with A, budgeting, B, compelling writing, and C, uh, support material. The obvious kind of difference is you'll need a U.S. bank account in order to get U.S. foundational grants, and you need to be operating in the U.S. They're not really going to fund a Canadian project, even if you bring in, let's say, U.S. folks into Canada across border to, let's say, facilitate workshops. Most of these grants want to see the funding on the ground within the state that perhaps the foundation is based in or within the country to ensure that you know funding kind of remains a revolving door within uh, the borders. Now, that could be a project that you definitely do, um, but just ensure as well to probably permits, licenses, letters of incorporation might have to also be um, completed in a US format of, or context, as opposed to, let's say, um, you know, only having a license to work in Canada. Great, thanks. Uh, there's a note also that US funds can theoretically go through Benevity and Veritas. Uh, another question. Um, uh, as a factor in influencing granting, how important would you say is applicants' previous history for having received grants? Uh, is it ideal mm. uh, to form collectives with others who have received grants before? Yeah, I'll answer the second question first, and that is a yes. You know, um, as long as the collect those people in the collective um, have the same passion for you for this current project, not just because you're not just choosing them because they're past grant recipients, right? But they have the skills and they have the background and the experience um, that will look really strong on this current proposal. And it's really great to involve other folks who receive grants because they've just been through the ringer before. They know the challenges, they know the language, and they know the importance of budgeting uh, sensibly. Now, your previous history, you know, sometimes I like to say you're only good as your last grant. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're, you know, Margaret Atwood and, and you've gone, you know, maybe 12 grants when you, when you're a youth and now you're applying for a new grant, you know, if it's not a strong grant, um, sometimes the name doesn't matter. And often I remember being on a jury where we would decline or reject grants from established artists simply because I think they were relying on their name, on their legacy to convince us that this project was important as opposed to bringing that in through their own project goals and mission. So you don't wanna to rely too much on your background. Um, if you did receive grants, it does help in one way, which is if you got a kind of grant, I remember this for Toronto Poetry Slam, if you got a grant to operate your organization throughout the year and suddenly you don't get a grant the next year, that could really be devastating for you as opposed to being a first time applicant. And so I think grant jurors, we weren't really instructed by this explicitly, but more implicitly that it's really going to be uh, harsh for us to cut off funding for granting for a grant that has always been kind of expected for an operational uh, funding for an organization. So that's something to keep in mind, too. Um, you're getting an operational grant is fantastic for that reason in itself. It will look strong to also show juries that you know a how to table a budget how to operate um during maybe times of 
of, uh, you know, challenge perhaps during COVID, if you got a grant during COVID, and that you have the capacity to hire personnel, to um, manage marketing, and to manage PR as well. So that that is going to be all things that are, are really going to be helpful to you. Amazing. Well, uh, thank you so much, David. Uh, there are no more questions. And so uh, this is super helpful. Uh, really appreciate your time. I'm